great to see you, and again, we're glad for your presence this morning. Thankful for those visiting with us, and thankful for each one who is able to be here. Some are back from having been sick. It's great to see you, and uh, glad that God and His providence has allowed us to meet together today. Beautiful day, and a great opportunity for us to worship together, take the Lord's Supper together, and hopefully learn a little more about the Word of God together, be reminded at least of some things that are worthy of, of remembering. Um, we uh, have started last uh, month, this month I guess, actually the first of this month, we began a, uh, a new class, uh, a uh, Sunday afternoon, first Sunday afternoon class for the men. We've been studying the subject of leadership and uh, it seems to be a subject that resonates with people. It seems like a lot of the fellows are interested in that subject, and I'm very glad. Let me hasten to say, I don't think leadership is just uh, for the fellows here. We recognize some limitations that God places upon the work of women. But that's a long way from saying that women don't have uh, a responsibility to lead in their circle and their sphere of influence. They absolutely do and always have. And so their work is important, too. But uh, we're trying to catch up, I guess, the, the fellows here, uh, me included, on the subject of leadership. So uh, if, uh, if that interests you, I hope that you will continue to make that a priority, to make time, because I believe that this is a time which we can share and help each other. We do have a number of fellows here uh, who have leadership experience, and we're trying to improve and trying to grow with our young folks this idea that we need to lead in God's service. Just as an aside to that, the way the schedule works out, I'm scheduled to be in a meeting uh, up in Tennessee uh, starting next Sunday. And so I will uh, miss the next class. Donald is going to teach the class next Sunday. And then, Lord willing, I plan to be back uh, for July's class. But then the first week in August, I'm supposed to be gone again, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, I do hope that you continue to make this a priority, and I look forward to the times that I can be with you and uh, be involved in that class. But just thinking about leadership, and that's been on our minds lately, certainly. Um, you know, I think that, that the greatest examples in the Bible, I've said this before, you go to the world and you read books on leadership written by business tycoons and smart fellows, and they've got a lot of great ideas. But all the great ideas that they have, you really can go back to the Bible, and you can find they're based on Bible principles every time. And I think one of the great stories of leadership in the work of God is the story found in the book of Nehemiah. So I invite you to turn with me there. We have just a few minutes this morning. But I'd like to think with you a little bit about this great old story and to learn just a couple of lessons about leadership from Nehemiah. Uh, the setting of Nehemiah, you remember, is that uh, by the time Nehemiah is written, uh, Israel has gone through, Judah in particular, has gone through a devastating period of destruction and of captivity. <laughs> Jerusalem, the great capital was captured and uh, finally destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Uh, that wasn't the first time the Babylonians came into Jerusalem. They had taken two waves of captives earlier. They had humiliated the people, but now they uh, really take out their anger upon the stubborn uh, Jewish nation, and they destroy the temple of Solomon. It's unthinkable to the Jews that the temple could be destroyed, it's gone. And for good reason. Read the prophet Ezekiel, and we remember how that God makes the point with Ezekiel that uh, by the time this temple is destroyed, I will have been long gone from it. Not my house anymore. But God is not through with his plan, but he certainly uh, brought destruction upon a nation that richly asked for it. The city is left in ruins, the temple is destroyed and the wall has been destroyed. And this exposes Israel not only to danger but to great reproach. By the way, for 140 years, 
Jerusalem was a city without walls. It begins here. It will go on in the future. And every time you, you went to the city, Jerusalem's a city on a hill, always has been. When you go to that city and you see the wall broken down and all the rubble, every time someone for 140 years went to Jerusalem, they'd be reminded, oh yeah, this is the place where God has brought destruction and ruin and misery. Well, uh, it was a, a time of sorrow uh, for the Israelites. Their pride had been wounded. Their uh, heart had been uh, uh, just uh, uh, torn to pieces. There's a poignant uh, description in Psalm 137 that we just can't forget uh, where the psalmist, uh, obviously having lived through this captivity, begins with these words, this this sad song, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, and we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. And there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It's a very powerful picture. And you have to feel that. And that's the way the nation felt for years. 70 years of captivity. And then we find uh, God brings about a change. By raising up leaders, three fellows in particular, Zerubbabel, uh, there was no king after Israel was taken captive in Israel. But this is as close as there would be to a king. He was the grandson, I think, of Jehoiakim. And uh, he's the man that God raised up uh, to lead the first great wave of returnees back to the land. It would be under Zerubbabel that the temple would be rebuilt. It was a process. And Haggai and Zechariah, the prophets, uh, implored the people, but eventually the, the temple was rebuilt, but it was, a, it was a, a shadow as far as the people were concerned of the great glorious temple of Solomon. But God told them, don't look so much at the externals. Ezra came back a generation later, and Ezra was the guy who got the law restarted. Uh, that is, the, the service of God really uh, uh, wrapped up. But the wall remained destroyed. It was not until Nehemiah uh, put his neck to that work that something changed. So I want to think with you a minute about Nehemiah particularly as the great example among those leaders. Uh, an example of a fellow, if you're looking for a man who uh, will get things done for the Lord, Nehemiah will show me and show you the way. What are the things that made Nehemiah so successful? One thing that's obvious is Nehemiah was a man who had a deep and personal concern for the work of God. When you begin reading this book, in the very first chapter, the first verse, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Kislu in the 20th year that I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, and certain men of Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, <clears throat> which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said, all the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the providence, in the province rather, are, are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates that are burned with fire. And it came to pass that when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days fasted. It was, uh, it was a horrific story uh, that, uh, that we find here of uh, the, uh, the, the city destroyed, the people there oppressed and afflicted, shamed and, and cowed by the inhabitants thereof. The work of God has been made a mockery. Now I want you to notice a couple of details. Remember with me. In the first place, Nehemiah is not in the outskirts of Jerusalem. Uh, he is in Shushan, or Susa sometimes it's modernly uh, referred to, the great palace 
of the Assyrian, of the, uh, of the Persians. By this time, the Persians have taken charge. And one of their capitals here at Susa was a magnificent structure. These fellows had several palaces. But some of the ruins of this particular palace have been found. Judd and I got to go overseas several years ago to a museum where they had a number of the artifacts from this particular palace and some of the reliefs on the wall uh, still in the original color. You get a look, those fellows don't look very friendly, do they? Uh, but uh, it was through the Persians that God did allow eventually the people to go back. But it was there in a palace a thousand miles from Jerusalem that Nehemiah heard about the distress of the people of God in that foreign place. And let me say this. He didn't just hear about it. He asked about it. He said, tell me what's going on with the people of God. Why would he ask? Not just making conversation, but because that was what was on his mind. No matter where he was, that was what was on his mind. Can that be said about us, by the way? And we've got a lot of things that take our attention, and we have a lot of responsibilities in our life. But I'm going to tell you, for people who are thinking as they ought to think, the work of God is never that far from their thinking, from their mind. How are things going? What are the problems? How can things get better? How can we overcome? This was the, the heart of Nehemiah. And when he heard how bad things were, the text says that he sat down and he wept and he mourned certain days and he fasted. I might just ask you the question, and all of us answer to ourselves, when's the last time you shed tears over the work of God? Does it really bother us that much? I know it does some here. I have no doubt about that. I trust all of us. But I'm sure there are some people uh, for whom the church is just sort of an afterthought or it's a habit. Or it's just a small part of my, well, I've got real important things, and then the church we work in where we can. It was not that way with Nehemiah. The work of God meant everything to him. And he's over here wearing fine clothes in a palace with a different life, but he certainly did not and could not forget the work of God. Something else that's, that strikes us about Nehemiah that I think was the key to his greatness was the fact that he was a man who clearly leaned on prayer. When you look at his story, how many times in the book of Nehemiah do you read uh, a reference to Nehemiah praying? It came to pass back in 1-4. When I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He was praying to God about this situation. Now just you might notice this fact that um, in the first verse, he identifies the fact that it was in the 20th year he was in Shushan, the palace, in the month of Kislu. The month of Kislu was the ninth month. It was in the November, December of the year. And that uh, ultimately, he was able to bring his request in the month of Nisan, uh, which was in the first month. It was several months that went by. Uh, from the ninth month to the first month in their calendar. I don't know why it was it took so long. Uh, it may have been the king wasn't in residence. Who knows what, but for whatever reason, there was a time period between the time that Nehemiah felt this burden on his heart and the time he was able to actually do something about it in terms of moving things forward. But that whole time was not inactive because he was given to prayer. He prayed to the God of heaven. He said he prayed this prayer day and night for the children of Israel. He doesn't have the fact they sinned. He doesn't say to God, this is unfair. He says, we deserve what we got. But I pray that you would be merciful. You promised to be merciful. You told Moses long ago, when we sinned, you'd punish us, but if we turned, you'd forgive us. And now I'm asking you in penitence, to forgive us and to relieve us. Verse 10. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power, by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee now, let thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of, uh, to the, to the, I'm sorry, to the prayer uh, of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper 
I pray thee that this thy servant grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. When you look at, at Nehemiah's prayer, day and night that he prayed, it all came back to one point. He's saying, Lord, please help me to have influence with the king to the point that he will give me what I need and let me go that I can help with the work back in Jerusalem. Uh, he was the king's cupbearer. You know, through the years we've heard people teach, uh, maybe, uh, maybe somebody talk about Nehemiah, and they've been rather dismissive about Nehemiah's position. He was just a butler. You know, he was just a waiter. One fellow said, it's just amazing to me that a fellow who was just a waiter in the king's house uh, would be of any use in Jerusalem. He didn't know how to lay bricks. They needed a brick mason, not a, not a, not a, 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 a waiter. I think that's really unfair to Nehemiah. I don't know what he knew about bricklaying, but his position was a lot more than just simply the lowly staff. Uh, to be the king's cupbearer was the most trusted position for obvious reasons. Uh, it, it involved proximity to the king. It also involved a position where you were really responsible for the king's security. Uh, he was the man who made sure that whatever came to the king was not poisonous. And poison was a very convenient way of making a change. Uh, if you didn't like the king or you wanted to move up and bump somebody out of the way. So this was a very responsible position. It was a very powerful position in that sense. And I think Nehemiah was the perfect man. He was perfectly placed to make a difference in this situation. And his prayer is, Lord, please help me to have influence over this man. You know, if you got Nehemiah open, you could look in chapter 2 and verse 4 and notice that when the moment finally does come, that Nehemiah uh, has the opportunity there, he prays again a quick prayer. Lord, help me to say the right thing here. Help me to be able to influence this man. But even as the story moves on, we find over and again that Nehemiah is a, a man given to prayer. In the fourth chapter, in verse 4, O Lord, hear our prayer when we are despised. We are reproached in the face of his enemies. When uh, threats came, in 4 and verse 9, we made our prayer unto God. Um, uh, just uh, throughout the book, in the, uh, in the fifth chapter, Think upon me, my God, verse 19, for good. Uh, in the sixth chapter, uh, may God uh, remember the treachery of Sanballat and, and, uh, and Tobiah. There was a constant dialogue, asking God for strength, asking God for mercy, asking God for justice. Nehemiah was a man given to prayer. So here's the point we remind myself and yourself of this. If we really want this work, the work of God in this place, the work that we have access to, to prosper, we have to be people who don't neglect prayer. I don't have, if I said that every week, if we said that together to each other every week, it wouldn't be too much. It's so easy to let so many things get in our way. We get so tired at work. We get distracted by all kinds of things. But we've got to make time every day to mention one another in prayer by name. And this work by name. If we believe that it matters. Nehemiah was a man who believed that what he prayed would be heard. And when it was heard in heaven, it would make a difference. If we believe that, I, there's no telling the good that God can do through us if we ask so Nehemiah asks. And when he has the ear of the king, and he speaks up at that moment, and the king says to him, what is it that you want? He said, if it please the king, chapter 2 and verse 5, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me to Judah unto the city of my father's sepulchres that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. You know, I read that several times through the years before I ever paid attention to that fact. That Nehemiah, when I asked, How long is it going to take? He had an answer. 
Now, one of the remarkable things about this story is how quickly all this work got done. Again, all those years it had been sitting there fallow. By the time Nehemiah came along, 140 years, roughly. But Nehemiah didn't expect to be in Jerusalem 140 years rebuilding it. He said, I believe this work can get done. And he gave the king a time. And uh, he also asked the king for the things that he would need. Letters to travel and letters likewise that would authorize the use of timber. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Nehemiah recognized that every success that he had ultimately came back to the work of God. Uh, Nehemiah was not a defeatist about the work of God. He had an optimistic attitude. He was not naive. He understood the problems. In fact, it's interesting in chapter 2, you remember, when he does come back to Jerusalem, he makes it a point, rather low key, he didn't come like Zerubbabel did with 50,000 Jews, or even with the 3,000 or whatever it was that uh, Ezra came back with. He came back basically with a very small number. He didn't storm the gates. And when he came back, he didn't let everybody know what his plan was right away. The first thing you want to do was see the damage in person. You could see some of it, I'm sure, whether you wanted to or not. But he wanted to see the full extent. So 2.11, we pick up the story. I came to Jerusalem, and I was there three days... And I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, neither told any, I, any man what God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and the dung port. And I viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, the gates thereof that were consumed with fire, and then said I unto them, having made his reconnaissance and seen for himself all that was to be done, he said, you see the distress that we are in, how that Jerusalem lies waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we no more be a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me. Also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And here was a critical moment. They said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. I say that was a critical moment because it could have gone another way. You know, there are a lot of folks who can see the problems, but they're not moved to change them. In fact, there are folks who sort of get used to problems. And we sort of said, well, you know, these walls have been broken so long. I can remember as a kid going by these old broken walls, and we sort of like them. We're just sort of satisfied. We got about this number, that's, a, that's about enough, and we don't need any more. And we're doing about enough, and that's enough. We're doing as much as other folks are. What I need is that spirit of Nehemiah that says that this is not enough, and we can do better, and we're expected to do better, and I've got a part in that. And if you have a fellow like Nehemiah who's on fire for that work, others will catch that fire. And that's what happened. And that's the greatness of Nehemiah here. Now there were some people, the enemies of the work, who were ready to mock. They always are. They laughed us to scorn. But Nehemiah answered them and he said, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. I'll tell you, whatever this church decides to do in the next five years, if God gives us five years, will not meet the approval of the world. There are those who will mock, and there are those who will say there's no use. But if we have this number fully committed to being better, individually and collectively, I'm going to tell you, God can do amazing things. Whatever he does, we'll be pleased with. But we've given him ourselves. Something about Nehemiah was that this work was not work that he did all himself. You ever heard that old adage, if you want something done right, do it yourself. I'm glad Nehemiah didn't believe that. 
Because if he had, there wouldn't have been much done. Maybe just one, uh, one archway would have been built. <laughs> Maybe one gate fixed. But Nehemiah was a part of a team. Uh, you go back and you look at this, and, and uh, the, again, the, the, the enemies were there. They always said, well, you know what these fellows are doing? A fox will go up and knock it down. Uh, but Nehemiah prayed to God for strength and for courage and for wisdom. And verse 6 of Nehemiah 4 says, We built the wall. The entire wall was joined together to half its height. And he said the people had a mind to work. It was a united effort. And it's fascinating to me the little no notes that are given in Nehemiah about the workers themselves. In the first place, in chapter 3, as this work is described, look who's working here. The high priest is working here. Uh, the, the Levites were working here. Uh, these were the, uh, uh, the folks who were uh, the leaders among Israel. But uh, these particular leaders were not too good to work. Let me tell you, there were others who maybe had a different idea. Chapter 3 and verse 5. Next unto them, each had his own section. Next unto them were the Tekoites. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. The people of Tekoa, their nobles did not very noble in terms of their commitment to the work. But you know, that doesn't describe the whole story. Look down in verse 27. Them of the Tekoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lies even under the wall of Ophel. The picture is that the men of Tekoa were assigned a particular area. Their nobles said, we ain't getting out there and sweating and doing that kind of work. That's rough work. Somebody else can do that or he can just be undone. They weren't very motivated. But the men of Tekoa showed their true nobility. Their nobles weren't very noble, but the true nobility was seen in what they did. And these folks were so zealous, they got through that section and got another section as well. Doesn't it remind you a little bit of Acts 17? That those of Berea were more noble than those of Thessalonica? He uses, the Holy Spirit does that word noble to describe someone who, uh, not talking about their, their family connections, but the nobility of spirit that was committed to doing God's things God's way. I think about uh, how that so much of this work was done by non-builders. Uh, and it, you see this several times, don't you, in Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 8. Uh, there's a section that's repaired by two fellows who are goldsmiths and another section repaired by a fellow who is one of the sons of the apothecaries. The old King James says, your translation may say the perfumers. What in the world does a perfumer know about making a, or building a wall? What does a goldsmith know about laying bricks? You know, I, maybe I'm stretching the point, but I do think it's something that's hard to miss. There, there's a whole lot of work done in Nehemiah by folks that are not experts. But there are people, I'm sure, who did it right. They didn't wait for an expert to come along. They just did the work. Does that have an application to us as the church? You read the history of the church uh, of our Lord in, in America, in Alabama, so much work was done back in the 19th century by people who were not experts. They were not seminary trained uh, or any other substitution for a seminary. Uh, they, they butchered the English of the day. They were uneducated formally. They were farmers who never had an opportunity to go to school much, but man, they knew the Bible. They could read they could tell you what they read. They could tell you what they believed. And they converted hundreds of people. It ain't about experts. It's about people who believe in what they're doing and are willing to work. That's a great lesson that Nehemiah exemplifies. And it gives me a lot of hope. It was, a lot of this work was done by families. You notice that too in 313. Um... I think that's what I was looking for. That's where he talks about the fella and his daughters who did the work there. 
I might have rushed that. Through. It was 12, I think it was, 312. Uh, yeah. He said that uh, next to him was Shalom, the son of Helohesh, ruler of half of Jerusalem. He and his daughters were doing the work there. <laughs> you know, there's a great deal of work done by families. That's true in the church today. There's a great deal done by families, by fathers and mothers and their children who simply share the message. A lot of them started where they lived. Do you notice that when you read this story? Um, uh, chapter 10, you have a group of fellows who uh, began working either against their house. There's a great parallel there as well. I've heard the point made you maybe have too. Here's a young man. He says, I want to go to uh, uh, Moldova and preach the gospel. Well, that's a great ambition. Why don't you start in McCullough? And, and then we'll, we're going to get somebody to Moldova. They need it too. But the idea is that we don't have to, to wait. We can start where we are, and we can work in the opportunities that we're given now. One more thing I want to mention to you, and our time is up. But, you know, the, one of the great things about Nehemiah that made him such a great leader was his, his moral authority that came from a personal example. There was an outcry, you remember, you know, the, the problems were not all without, were they? The problems within were serious problems. These folks had been under reproach for years. Some of them had, were indebted to the Gentiles. And uh, Nehemiah had come back and had tried to help people get out of debt so that they could get that, that uh, weight of uh, debt off of their neck. But then you had other fellow Jews who saw people in financial trouble and who wound up uh, lending them money at usury. And they just became the landlords who were in a heavy-handed way were keeping people down and uh, strangling them with this high interest. And when that came to Nehemiah, that people uh, had lost their land to their own brethren, they couldn't pay their, their, their uh, expenses, Nehemiah hit the ceiling. And he, uh, he, he tore into them. He said, you exact usury from your brother. He said, we've spent our time here working, by the way, for free, not charging you as governor. And we've been trying to get people out of debt. Shall we pay you now to get them out of debt again? Stop lending money at usury. Stop taking benevolent cases and trying to make money off of people and, and charging them exorbitant amount. And I'll tell you what these folks said. They said, we'll do it. Whatever you said, we'll do it. And part of the reason why was because Nehemiah could point to his own example and say, look, I've been here now for some time and I am not. For 12 years, we haven't eaten at your expense, though we have the right to do so. All the time we've been here, verse 16, we didn't buy up land and, and look at this as an opportunity. We were trying to help these folks, our brethren, because we feared God. At my table, verse 17, there'd be 150 Jews that would eat at my expense because they, they didn't have any other way to help themselves. These are the people you've been trying to fleece and rob behind our back. God judged between you and me. Because the bondage was heavy on this people. We've been, we've been trying to give instead of take. And that shamed these folks so much that even though they were so hardened that they could rob their brethren, in the face of Nehemiah's example, all they could do was just lay it down and say, we are wrong. It's a great example. And if you want to get things done, it's going to have to start by giving that kind of example, isn't it? We're going to have to show people that we're serious before we can encourage others to do the same. That's true with your children, by the way. Want to motivate your children? Of course you do. Show them that you're on fire for God and that nothing matters more than His work. That's the best way, the best hope we have of influencing our young folks that we love so much. Well, 6.15 tells us that the wall was finished. 
It took 52 days. No matter how many times we read that, it's still amazing. 52 days. It, it took uh, 52 days to get everybody organized, looks like. 52 days. And the wall was done. And when the enemy saw that, oh, they were cast down, to say the least. They were crushed because they perceived that this work was wrought by our God. That's right. I, I say this without malice, but wouldn't it be great if all the enemies of the simple New Testament gospel in this community were crushed because you leaned on God and did things that they didn't think were possible. I think that'd be good for everybody, them included. I appreciate your kind attention. I hope that Nehemiah will inspire all of us to think about ourselves individually and think about how we can be a better help and a better influence on our work, our work for God going forward. If you haven't already, please take out your songbooks and turn to the number that's been selected, if it be your desire, even this morning, to begin your service to God, to make the good confession, to come in repentance, leaving an old life behind and beginning today to serve God, be baptized into Christ. We'd be glad to help you with that. Maybe you've done that, but you've somehow lost your way and lost your perspective, then make it right with God. Turn around, and he'll be glad to receive you. Maybe there's some way we can help you. We'd love to do that. Let us know how, while we stand, while we sing.